I'm going to depart from tradition, too. But someone left a knife up here. <laughs> and I'm also going to depart from tradition. I don't know whether the, the title of this lecture has been announced, but I want you to hear the title anyway before I give the lecture. Perhaps you know it, because the title is the theme of the lecture. The title is Why It Is Sometimes Necessary to Read Aristotle Backwards. In years of reading the treatises of Aristotle, and I started a long time ago, back in 1921, I have found that one important rule to follow in overcoming the difficulties that all of us have encountered, I'm sure, in understanding the doctrines contained in his works is to read the pages backwards. That is, to apply what we find in a later portion of the given treaties to the interpretation of what we have already read in an earlier portion. To illustrate the operation of this rule, I have chosen for this occasion Aristotle's conception of practical truth, which occurs in Book Six of the Ethics, I'm going to try to show you how this conception affects our interpretation of crucial passages in Book 3 and Book 1. In fact, it's only by going back to Book 3 and to Book 1 that one can understand what is being said in Book 6. And in addition, one cannot have un could not have understood what is being said in Book 1 and Book 3 until one has understood what is said in Book 6. It's that kind of back and forth motion book you've all read uh, from the freshman year on, you've all read Aristotle's Ethics, it's a difficult book, and this is a lesson in the reading of that book. But my interest in the subject goes beyond the importance of the subject itself. Its importance, I think, cannot be overestimated. Aristotle's conception of practical truth should control our interpretation of the ethics as a whole, understanding it as a moral philosophy that is not simply theological, teleological and pragmatic, which is the interpretation that has prevailed in many quarters from Kant onwards, but is basically a deontological ethics, an ethics whose first principle is the self-evident statement of a categorical obligation, an ethics in which the word ought or should, ought or should, has validity. Beyond that, my interest lies in the fact that Aristotle's definition of practical truth, had it been known to and understood by contemporary analytic and linguistic philosophers, would have saved them from preoccupation with the pseudo-problem and from espousing the solution of it that they adopted with disastrous consequences for the science, for the status of ethics, regarding it as they do, as non-cognitive rather than as a body of knowledge that is, a set of principles and conclusions that can lay claim to being true. That there is such widespread ignorance of Aristotle's introduction of a twofold conception of truth, sharply distinguishing between the truth of theoretical or descriptive statements on the one hand and the truth of practical or normative statements on the other, can perhaps be explained, though hardly excused, by the fact that his treatment of this crucial matter is contained in a single paragraph in Book 6, Chapter 2 of the Ethics. And if those of you want to make a note, the lines in the, the Becca lines in the Greek original are 1139a, 21 to 31. The distinguishing characteristic of practic practical truth is formulated in six words, just six words, at the end of that paragraph. To my knowledge, the matter, con matter considers in that one paragraph and the formulation contained in those six words is not mentioned anywhere else in the Aristotelian corpus. Hence, a reader of Aristotle who is not attentive to one brief appearance of this discussion and does not pause to consider its full significance for the rest of the ethics will be ignorant of the point and will inevitably mis misinterpret the rest of the book. What I've just said holds that only for the analytic and linguistic philosophers who have probably not read Aristotle carefully, if at all, but also for Kant, for John Stuart Mill, and a host of other Oxford commentators on the ethics 
who have certainly read the book, but who seem to have missed or ignored the point under consideration. The formulation that Aristotle advanced in the last six words of the paragraph cited calls for an extended exploration. The words, by the way, let me give you the words as they occur in that, just that last sentence. Uh, he talks about, the, the, in the two, three lines before that, he talks about truth and falsity and everything intellectual, while of the part which is practical and intellectual also, the good state is, and here are the last six words, truth in agreement with right desire. It is truth in agreement with right desire. Aristotle himself nowhere tells us what he means by right desire, a phrase which occurs in the body of the paragraph and just in those last six words. Notice, notice does he develop the implica implications of what is meant by that phrase. However, we're given some help in doing that for ourselves by a few brief statements el elsewhere in his words, especially in the opening sentence of the metaphysics, where Aristotle says, all men by nature desire to know. In the opening sentence of the ethics, which he says that everything, all, all action aims at the good. In distinctions that developed only in book three, in chapter four, and two paragraphs of chapter five, and one brief sentence in the fifth chapter of book 10. But nowhere does Aristotle call our attention to the bearing of these passages on the conception of practical, practical truth presented in the Ethics, Book 6, Chapter 2. Yet their bearing is crucial. Without the light that they throw on the meaning of right desire, it is impossible in my judgment to understand what sense can be made of the statement that whereas truth of the theoretical or, des of descriptive, or, theoretical or descriptive statements, statements that contain some form of the word is and is not, is quite, uh, that kind of truth consists in the agreement of the statement with reality, with what is or is not, whereas the truth of practical or normative statements containing some form of the words ought or ought not consists in their agreement with right desire. If the few math passages mentioned are so important, it may be wondered why Aristotle treated the observations and distinctions they contain so briefly, almost glancingly, why did he not call explicit attention to how the several points being made therein are related to one another in a single comprehensive doctrine that should control our understanding of the ethics as a whole? Why is that doctrine nowhere explicitly stated? The only answer that occurs to me is that Aristotle must have, must have assumed that the audience to which he was lecturing already understood the unstated doctrine, that it was part of the accepted wisdom in his day shared by students in the academy and the lyceum, and that a mere mention of the points involved therefore sufficed. Sound as it may have been in the fourth century BC, that assumption does not hold for modern students from the 17th century on, including here the leading representatives of modern philosophy. No wonder then that the ethics is so generally misunderstood so generally commented on, either adversely or favorably, for doctrines it does not advance. No wonder that its central controlling insight, insights have gone completely unnoticed in this literature of commentary. No wonder that the exponents of the contemporary view that ethics must be non-cognitive would appear to be able to make out a strong case for that false position. With these preliminary observations, I would like to proceed as follows. First, to indicate why the ignorance of Aristotle's conception of practical truth allows a strong case to be made for the view that ethics must be non-cognitive. Second, to show how two distinctions that Aristotle assumed were generally understood by his audience permitted him to assume that his audience would also readily understand what he meant by right desire. And third, to summarize briefly the central doctrine that emerges from these considerations a doctrine that should control our understanding of the ethics as a whole. The view that ethics is non-cognitive was advanced in the first part of this century by A.J. Eyre, R.M. Hare, and C.L. Stevenson in the 1930s and 40s. Earlier in the century, Bertrand Russell 
had encapsulated this view in a quip that ran somewhat as follows. I quote, ethics is the art of recommending to others what they should do in order to get along with oneself. <laughs> Since the different views of what a non-cognitive ethics consists in are of no interest to us, I will confine my attention to the reasons that A.J. Eyre gave for thinking that ethics must be non-cognitive, which means in no sense is ethics a, a, a kind of knowledge. For air, for air, only sentences that make statements, sentences that are declarative and mood, not imperative, subjunctive, or interrogative, can be either true or false. Aristotle made the same point somewhat earlier in his fourth chapter of the book on interpretation. The propositions expressed by declarative sentences can possess, possess one or another of the only two sorts of truth which air is, with which air is acquainted. On the one hand, the kind of a priori, verbal or logical truth that is found in analytical propositions. On the other hand, the kind of a posteriori, empirically verifiable truth that is to be found in propositions stating matters of fact. In the latter case, what is truly stated is a description of the way things are. So far as all a posteriori descriptive propositions go, air does not appear to part company with Aristotle's statement that the truth of such propositions consists in their asserting that that which is is and that that which is not is not, as Aristotle says in the seventh chapter of the fourth book of the Metaphysics. For air, of course, analytical propositions are all of the sort that Locke, John Locke calls trivial or non-instructive, whereas for Aristotle, axioms or self-evident first principles are far from being trivial or uninstructive. This is a difference to which I shall return presently. Statements that contain such words as good and bad, right and wrong, ought and ought not, and that cannot be somehow reduced to descriptive statements of fact, are clearly incapable of having the truth or falsity that is appropriate to descriptive statements. With that observation, neither Aristotle nor anyone else can cavil if statements do not assert that something is or is not their truth cannot consist in their agreeing with what is or is not. According to air, they must be therefore regarded as expressions of emotion or as commands that are designed to provide pr pr provoke action of one sort or another. Air then goes further. Sentences, sentences that contain the words indicated above and that cannot be interpreted as descriptive, he regards as not making any sort of statement at all. I quote him. <clears throat> if a sentence makes no statement at all, there is obviously no sense in asking whether what it says is true or false. And we have seen sentences which simply express moral judgments do not say anything. They are purely expressions of feeling, and as such do not come under the category of truth and falsehood. They are an unverifiable for the same reasons as a cry of pain or a word of command is unverifiable, because they do not express genuine propositions. In saying this, Eyre goes further than he needs in order to support his thesis that ethics is non-cognitive. There is no ground for saying that the sentence, human beings ought to seek knowledge, asserts nothing. The fact that the statement it makes is normative, the fact that it's an ought statement rather than a descriptive and is statement, does not justify Eyre in, dis in dismissing the sentence is not making an assertion or statement at all. However, the pivotal question still remains unanswered. Granted that a declarative statement is not precluded from making a statement, that a declarative sentence is not precluded from making a statement or expressing a proposition because it contains the word ought rather than the word is. Nevertheless, the question remains, how can normative propositions, which do say ought rather than is, be true? if the only kind of truth is the one kind that is exclusively appropriate to descriptive propositions, the kind of truth defined in the seventh chapter of the fourth book of the Metaphysics. Nowhere, nowhere in the discussion of truth in that fourth book of the Metaphysics does Aristotle allude or hint that there may be another kind of truth, nor does he do so in the fourth chapter of the day interpretation, uh, where he separates declarative from all of the types of sentences, 
that doesn't do that as he suggests the declarative sentences may be subdivided into two subtypes the is sentences and the ought sentences hence if A.J. Ayer's reading of Aristotle were confined to the metaphysics and the uninterpretation, he would be justified in citing Aristotle in support of his view that ethics, at least to the extent that it contains normative judgments or ought propositions, must be non-cognitive. For Aristotle does not appear to, appear to acknowledge ought sentences as a declarative, and even if he did, his theory of truth would not apply to normative judgments or our propositions. If there is only one kind of truth, and if that kind consists in asserting what in fact is or is not the case, then statements which assert that something ought or ought not to be the case can be neither true nor false. If, however, Ayer and others who share his view, and that is, for the most part, most uh, persons who have been brought up in the tradition of recent philosophy in England and the United States, if they had read and tried to understand that one brief paragraph in the second chapter of the four, sixth book of the Ethics, he and they might never have gained, have raised the question about how normative propositions can be true or false. Air and all the others certainly proceed as if that question had never been raised before and as if no one had ever proposed an answer to it. But since the brief statement that practical truth consists in the agreement of a normative judgment with right desire does not explain itself, and since the explanation of it is not immediately apparent, mere acquaintance with that text on the part of Ayer and others would probably have made a little, di little difference to their thinking. Now let's see what can be learned by going back from that text in the second chapter of the sixth book of the ethics to earlier statements made in earlier books and chapters. What is right desire? The answer must be that right desire consists in desiring what one ought to desire. What ought one to desire? The answer cannot be, simply and without qualification, that we ought to desire what is good. Aristotle tells us in the opening paragraph of the Ethics that voluntary actions springing from desires always aim at the good. Hence, if the good is always and only the desirable, and if the desirable is always and only the good, there must be some difference between the good that we wrongly desire and the good that we rightly desire. That difference is to be found in the distinction between the real and the apparent good, a distinction that was part of the accepted wisdom in the academy. Socrates repeatedly calls attention, as in Plato's Meno, to the fact that whatever we desire appears good to us because we desire it. However, as Socrates always goes on, that fact does not make it really good for us. If the good were always and only that which appears good to us because we actually and consciously desire it, how could there be a difference between right and wrong desire? That which is really good for us must be something we ought to desire, whether in fact we actually and consciously desire it. The desirable must include both that which we ought to desire because it is really good for us and that which appears good to us because we actually and consciously desire it. Now in the Ethics, in Book 3, Chapters 4 and 5, Aristotle, again very glancingly, making no fuss about it, saying this is a very important point, just says it in the course of saying something else, relates to the distinction between the real and the apparent good to the distinction between two kinds of desire. On the one hand, the desires that are inherent in our common human nature, rooted in potentialities or capacities that seek fulfillment. On the other hand, desires that we acquire in the course of and as the result of our individual experience. Our natural desires are always present in us and are operative tendentially or repetitively, whether we, whether we are conscious of them or not. 
In contrast, contrast, we are always conscious of our individual acquired desires when they are operative. Furthermore, only the latter, the conscious desires, the individual desires, belong to the sphere of the voluntary or volitional. In Ethics, Book 3, Chapter 4, Aristotle says that while the good is the object of desire for every man, and I've got a quote, that... <laughs> Congratulations, Mort. You've said the secret word. Here is your shot. The quotation I was about to read. <laughs> is so good that it doesn't need an obligato. <laughs> now then listen to the quotation. That which is in truth an object of desire is an object of desire of the good man, while any chance thing, the, the, the crucial words are in truth, that which is in truth an object of desire is an object of desire of the good man, well, while any chance thing may be so to the bad man. This follows, that little statement follows another statement that reads as follows. Those who say that the good is the object of desire must admit in consequence that that which the man who does not choose a right desires is not an object of desire. For if it is to be so, it must also be what does it happen bad. While those who say that the apparent good is the object of desire must admit that there is no natural object of desire, but only that which appears good to the, each man. Now different things appear good to different people, and as it happens, even contrary things. I assure you that if you were to spend a great deal of time, a great deal of time on just that one paragraph, uh, which most people read and pass by. I'm sure that when you read the ethics the first time, you didn't even notice that paragraph. But I assure you that that paragraph is absolutely controlling, absolutely controlling for what you understand in book six and what you understand in book one. I cannot, I can't exaggerate that. Ignore what that paragraph says about the real and the apparent good and about natural and conscious desire, and the rest of the ethics makes no sense. It's as simple as that, and yet... What, what would call your attention to that? Why would you pay attention to that if you weren't controlled by that paragraph, that single sentence in the second chapter of book six about right desire, desiring a right? There, there's no way to avoid these consequences, Aristotle warns us, unless we distinguish between the real good, the good aimed at by our natural, inborn, appetitive tendencies, and the apparent good, that which appears good to us simply because of some acquired desire has become operative and of which we are conscious. That which we actually, actually and consciously desire may, of course, be, be the good that is aimed at by our inborn appetitive tendencies. In other words, that which is really good may also appear good to the man who actually and consciously desires it. The man who actually desires what is really good for him, according to his natural appetite, is one who desires a right one who desires what he ought to desire. He is the good or virtuous man. For to be virtuous is to have the habit of right desire in the act of choice. As Aristotle says in the fifth chapter of the tenth book, that which appears good to the good man is really good. No, well, that sounds like a circle, but it isn't. That which appears good to the good man is really good. Let me employ the English word needs and wants to designate natural desires on the one hand and acquired desires on the other. The goods aimed at by our needs 
other things that are really good for us. The goods we want always appear good to us when and because we want them, but they may be really bad for us. Since our needs do not belong to the sphere of the voluntary or volitional, we cannot say that we ought or ought not to need something. It's utterly silly to say we ought to need something or ought not to need something. We cannot say that a need is right or wrong. That can be only said of wants, which belong to the sphere of the voluntary or volitional. Our wants can be right or wrong. Right, if they aim at that which is really good for us, either good in itself or good because it facilitates our attaining that which is really good for us. Similarly, our wants can be wrong. Wrong if they aim at that, at that which is really bad for us, either bad in itself or bad because it somehow impedes or frustrates our attaining that which is really good for us. One concrete example will suffice to illustrate this. In the opening sentence of the metaphysics, Aristotle says, as I said before, all men by nature desire to know. Knowledge is a real good, a good that is aimed at by an appetitive tendency inherent in human nature by reason of man's cognitive capacity. All men need knowledge. Those who consciously seek knowledge, those who consciously seek knowledge, desire a, desire a right. They have right desire. They want what they ought to seek. They want what they need. The man who, through sloth, turns away from seeking knowledge because he wishes to avoid the pain and effort of doing so, and who habitually chooses to indulge inordinately in the pleasures of sense rather than engage in thoughtful inquiry, is not a virtuous man, for he has a habit of wrong rather than of right desire. We can now apply our understanding of right desire to practical truth conceived as being the conformity of a normative judgment with right desire. The judgment that I ought to seek knowledge is a normative truth because it conforms to right desire, desire that aims at a real good, a good that fulfills the natural appetite arising from my cognitive capacity. That true normative judgment is the conclusion of a practical syllogism in which the major premise is the one self-evident principle that lies at the foundation of all moral reasoning. Real goods ought to be desired. That statement, real goods ought to be desired, is as self-evident as the whole is greater than the part. The self-evidence of this proposition is exactly like the self-evidence of the whole is greater than any of its parts. Just as we cannot understand wholes without understanding them, without understanding them to be greater than any of their parts, so we cannot understand real goods without understanding them to be that which we ought, that which ought to be desired. Just as it, just as it is impossible to think of a whole that is less than any of its parts. So it is impossible to think of a real good that ought not to be desired, or of something that is really bad for us as something that ought to be desired. The self-evident principle has the truth of an analytical proposition. Its truth cannot consist in conforming to right desire, for it is a truth about right desire itself. <laughs> when they turned the main light switch off. <laughs> I, I, I had to finish the lecture then by using matches. <laughs> Let me just repeat that self-evident truth for a moment. Real goods ought to be desired if to, the, to, if to that self-evident true normative principle by the way, uh, I ought to say that I gave this lecture in Japan. <laughs> uh, 
And I had to pause every two paragraphs to have it translated to Japanese. And the Japanese translation was 10 paragraphs long. It was much more difficult than this. If I add to that self-evident first principle, the true descriptive proposition that man has a natural desire for knowledge, I've constructed a practical syllogism that leads to the conclusion, the true conclusion, I ought to seek knowledge. Now, that normative conclusion is not only true because it validly follows from the premises that are, the premises that are true, but also because the judgment itself, you can see at once, conforms to right desire. I said earlier that the modern conception I wish I... Oh, I see. <laughs> you know... <laughs> uh, I, I can... I can do this. Uh, <laughs> If, 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 the, if the stand just moves slowly back and forth, <laughs> I assure you, I can follow the stand better than you can follow the lecture. Aristotle's conception of practical or normative truth not only provides us with the ground for rejecting non-cognitive ethics in all its current varieties, it also enables us to dispose of the so-called naturalistic fallacy that, beginning with David Hume, has occupied the attention of so many modern thinkers. Given the self-evident principle that real goods ought to be desired, which is analytically true, and one or another true descriptive factual proposition about man's natural desires or needs, a normative conclusion validly follows, and the conclusion is normatively true. Lacking a self-evident first principle as the ultimate foundation of all normative or practical reasoning, it will be impossible to reason validly to a normative conclusion. As Hume quite correctly pointed out, from two factual or is premises, no normative or ought conclusion can be drawn. Let me leave all that logic for that moment and in the few remaining moments show you how what I've just expounded from books six, one sentence really, and a, well, less than a, almost a full paragraph in book three, chapter four, really affects your understanding of what you read in book one. You, you have to you're expected to read a book one, two, three, four, and if you did it that way, if you read book one and didn't go back to book one, after you read book three and book six, I say to you, you would not understand book one. Now, I'm not going back to book one, again, to read it again in the light of what I've learned from book six and book three. Particularly in book one, the crucial chapters, which are seven to ten. And if you look at those chapters and see now the light I'm going to throw on them, you will see a very striking indication of the desirability of reading Aristotle backwards as well as forwards. Though a large number of particular goods are mentioned in book one, health, wealth, pleasures of sense, honor, and wisdom, and though the, these are classified as external goods, goods of the body and goods of the soul, and further differentiated as mere means, or ends that are also means, Aristotle does not tell us whether all are real good. The word real good does not occur anywhere in book one. Whether only some of these are or whether none is. I cannot find, as I say, in book one, any reference, however slight, to the appetitive tendencies that are inherent in human nature, much less an inventory of man's natural appetites that would enable, to, uh, enable us to ascertain the real goods at which they aim. However, from the fact that Aristotle thinks that a moderate supply of external goods, such consumable wealth as food and drink and clothing and shelter, are necessary for a good life, and from the fact that he also appears to think 
that such bodily goods as health, vigor, and a moderate amount of pleasure also contribute to living well, we are certainly entitled to infer that he regards the goods so far mentioned as real rather than apparent. Good men ought to try to possess these goods if they aim at a life that fulfills their nature, befits their nature. His discuss discussion of the functions peculiarly appropriate to man's rational nature also entitle us, to, entitle us to infer that goods of the mind, such as knowledge and wisdom, are really good as fulfilling man's cognitive faculty. To add to this list of real goods, friendship and the advantages of living in a well-constituted state with the status of citizenship, we should have to appeal to this. The politics, book one, where we learn that man is by nature a political as well as a social animal, that the city comes into existence for the sake not of life, but of the good life. The indispensability of friendship for the good life is a for, of course confirmed in ethics books, book eight. For our present purposes, we need not pause to ask whether we've now exhaustively enumerated the real goods at which the appetitive tendencies inherent in human nature aim. Nor need we be concerned here with which of these is a means to the attainment of others, which, though a means to happiness, is also desirable for its own sake, and which ought to be aimed at with or without some limitations on the quantity of it that ought to be sought. Proceeding on the assumption that an exhaustive enumeration of man's natural appetites can be made, together with an exhaustive inventory of the real goods that man ought to seek, we must now ask about the relation of this set of real goods correctly ordered to happiness of the good life. Ethics 1, Book 1, Chapter 7, is indisputably clear on two points. One is that the good life as a whole is not a means to any further good, but rather the one and only ultimate or final end toward the attainment of which all other goods serve as means. The other point is that happiness has this status as a final end because the possession of it, only of course cumulatively in the course of a complete life, leaves nothing further to be desired. A happy or good life, Aristotle tells us, is one that is lacking in nothing. But though it is supremely good and is most desirable, this is the telling phrase, it must not be counted as one good among others, for if it was so counted, it would clearly be made more desirable by the addition of even the least of goods. For that which is added becomes an excess of goods, and of goods the greater is always more desirable. Happiness, so conceived, cannot be the summum bonum, if that is interpreted to mean the highest particular good in a series of such goods the one among all partial goods that is most desirable. Other goods might still be lacking. Instead, we must use the phrase totem bonum to express Aristotle's conception of happiness. The whole, the whole of real goods attained successively and cumulatively in the course of a complete life. Each of the particular and partial goods, real goods, so far mentioned, is a constitutive means to happiness, but they are the parts which, as acquired, serve to constitute the whole. The one good that has not been mentioned so far is virtue, specifically moral virtue. That it is indispensable to the attainment of happiness is also indisputably clear in Ethics 1.7. But it is not a real good of the same sort as all the real goods so far mentioned. Even if it fulfills an inherent appetitive tendency, as the other real goods do, it is not merely a constitutive means to happiness. It stands apart from all the rest by being the one operative means, functioning as that without which one cannot attain all the other real goods that one ought to seek as constitutive part for the whole good life. We know, however, that it is only a necessary, not a sufficient condition for their attainment, because Aristotle, in Book 1, Chapters 8 and 10, makes indisputably clear that both good fortune and good habits of choice, and moral virtue is nothing but good habits of choice, are required for the attainment of good life. Moral virtue by itself makes a man, not a life, good. A man must not only be virtuous, but must also be blessed by good fortune in order to achieve a good life for himself. In Ethics 1, chapters 4 and 5, Aristotle tells us that, that all men concur in the use of the word happiness to signify that which is desirable for its own sake and not as a means to anything else. 
They hold many different conceptions of happiness or the good life, what the good life consists in. That some of these are wrong conceptions, that there's only one right conception of what happiness consists in, can only be explained in the light of the distinction between real and apparent goods, together with the self-evident principle that all real good ought to be desired. If anyone thinks that happiness consists in, li in a life of pleasure, or in a life devoted to the accumulation of wealth, or even one devoted to achieving honor, his mistake consists in ignoring the other real goods that he ought to seek in order to be happy. That being so, there is only one correct conception of happiness as the attainment of all the real goods that a man ought to seek in order to fulfill the appetitive tendencies inherent in his nature. To say that happiness can consist in achieving whatever good a man happens to desire according to the wants arising from his individual temperament experience, or to say that one man is happier than another in proportion as he is more successful in satisfying his individual wants, whatever they may happen to be, and without regard to the difference between right and wrong desires, would make Aristotle's ethics merely purely utilitarian and pragmatic, teleological in the sense that it involves the consideration of the means to be chosen for the attainment of the end the individual happens to set himself. Only if there is one right end that all men ought to aim at, right because it consists in all the real goods that a man ought to see as means for that end, does Aristotle's ethics become deontological as well as teleological. One marvelously succinct statement made by St. Augustine could have been made by Aristotle, for it combines, combines the basic insights derived from Ethics 6.2, Ethics 3.4, Book 3, Chapters 4 and 5, were those derived from Ethics Book 1, Chapter 7. Augustine said, happy is the man who has all that he desires, provided he desire nothing amiss. Aristotle might have said the same thing as follows. Happy is the man who has all that he desires, provided that he desires what he ought to desire, and nothing that interferes with his attainment of the end that he ought to aim at. Still another way of saying the same thing is by regarding the normative first principle as follows. One ought to seek, in the course of a complete life, all the things that are really good, according to the appetitive tendencies of one's human nature, and nothing that interferes with the attainment of these goods in the right order and proportion. Moral virtue, as the firm habit of choosing a right, is obviously indispensable to desiring nothing amiss. This brings us to Aristotle's own succinct summary statement of his theory of happiness, which occurs in the Ethics, Book 1, Chapter 10, that it consists in a complete life lived in accordance with complete virtue and attended by a moderate supply of external goods, whatever other goods may depend in part on good fortune. Thank you.